Hey guys. Okay, so this is our final Beowulf lecture. We are looking at, no spoiler here, quote, Beowulf's last lecture. So remember, anytime you see italicized text, it indicates a large section of the text has been removed, which we see happening with the various journeys throughout the text. So we miss out on all that happens as they're traveling um, to and from Herat and pick up in the actual action um, right before and during a battle. So the final section begins with an emphasis on material wealth and that becomes a really important theme in this final entry. Quote, Beowulf laden with Hrothgar's gifts returns to the land of his own people. A dragon having guarded the cave of treasures for hundreds of years is provoked by a thief plundering a cup. It says after his uncles and cousins die, Beowulf becomes king of the Geats and rules in peace and prosperity for 50 years. So this is number one, a nod to the Anglo-Saxon value of heritage or the importance of legacy. We talked about that with our epic hero. Um, but it also makes the timeline murky because how long did the uncles rule and the cousins before the throne was passed to Beowulf? So it's not that 50 years have passed since Grendel and his mother, but that Beowulf has ruled for 50 years. So we really don't know how old he is or how long it's been, but he is certainly a old man. So he utters what is called his final boast. There is no efforts to um, be ambiguous here. He acknowledges the great legacy of his youth. And then here's a quote that you might want to pull for your paper next week. He says, I will fight again, seek fame still. He says farewell to each of his followers, each in turn for the last time. So does this build suspense? Or does this rob the narrative of suspense? Do we have any doubt here um, that this is Beowulf's final battle? He says also, I feel no shame with shield and sword. So Beowulf rekindles the legend of his fighting Grendel with no weapons, but he declares that this adversary, the fire breathing breath of this dragon is something different. He states, I mean to stand, not run, till fate decides which of us wins. He asks his friends to wait close by and to see who shall win this battle. Now, this is a far less confident Beowulf. Although he still goes into this battle with a ceremonial boast, it is a tale of his past deeds not a promise of what the battle holds. So going all the way back to the first week when you watched the video and you guys had to describe um, in what way is boasting different today than it was in Anglo-Saxon times, a lot of you pointed out that um, boasting was more about bragging about what you were going to do. And so we see here this shift is happening because he's not too confident at all and what he's going to do. So instead he does kind of give his resume of what he has done and why he still deserves our great respect as a warrior, although he's pretty confident he's gonna lose this one. Hmm, okay, where am I? So what is his motivation? So motivation is huge. Remember I told you follow this throughout um, is something you're gonna visit on that essay next week. So it's his own kingdom he's now protecting and his people are the ones being terrorized by this adversary, a fire breathing dragon. He states, what I mean to hear, no man but me could hope to defeat this monster. No one could try. And this dragon's treasure, his gold and everything hidden in that tower will be mine. As with Grendel and his mother, Beowulf is the only one who can defeat this monster, terrorizing the people, maybe. But a different exchange is happening here. Rather than being rewarded for his deed, he is claiming his own reward. So is he battling the dragon to save his people or to fill his pockets? 
And if the answer is both, where does that balance of the two motivations lean? So Beowulf goes to hunt a dragon. Um, the rocky cliffs, no coward could have walked there. Through the hidden entrance, too hot for anyone to stand. A streaming current of fire and smoke. Beowulf calls out to the dragon. He lowers his sword and roars a battle cry, provoking the dragon, daring him to come fight. So we have a much older Beowulf a much weaker Beowulf, a slower Beowulf, but certainly no less brave. Beowulf's shield fails him. Um, it says, quote, the flames beat at the iron shield and for a time it held, protected Beowulf as he planned, then it began to melt. Then his sword also fails him. So this is a similar complication to what happened in the battle with Grendel's mother as she bites through the helmet that had protected him in so many previous battles. The audience has come to expect a certain chain of events. And there's a catharsis of emotion when the outcome is different than what is expected. Um, we see this happen in Shakespeare, uh, most notably Romeo and Juliet, that, you know, the chorus comes onto the stage at the opening of the play and say, these two star-crossed lovers are going to marry, um, and it's only with their deaths that it'll bury their family's strife. And so they tell you it's going to happen before the play ever starts. But throughout it, um, Shakespeare plays with you. And he's like, um, okay, she's going to kill herself here. She's drinking poison. It might be real. No. You know, he's in a fight with Tybalt, Tybalt's dead, Romeo's gone, nope. And so that when they finally do die, um, your emotions have been played with so much that it makes the emotional release that much stronger. It's what the Greeks called catharsis. Um, we see it happening today in modern storytelling too, the idea of misleading um, your reader to think one thing's going to happen so that when they come to expect that and something different happens, there's a much stronger emotional response. And so um, we've seen this Beowulf, we've seen his weaponry and his armor fail, but quote, for the first time in his life, that famous prince fought with fate against him, with glory denied him. Why is this? Is it because he is, after all, only human, um, and at this point, a rather elderly man? Or is this the punishment for his diverged motivation and his focus on material gain? Beowulf, quote, stared at death, a journey into darkness that all men must make, as death ends their few brief hours on earth. Where is the Christian influence on that part of the text? Has this materialistic shift in focus disqualified him from any longer being a godlike character or even an agent of God? All of Beowulf's men ran for their lives, except one. Remembering as a good man must what kinship should mean. And this is when we meet Wiglaf. So let's look at the way he's introduced. First, his lineage is explained. Then his part in history of battles fought is explained. And finally, his loyalty and courage as a warrior is shown as he alone raises a sword to fight against the dragon that has nearly defeated Beowulf um, in quite obviously a battle about to be lost. This is a new hero emerging. As Beowulf is dying, his predecessor, the next legend, is being birthed. Wiglaf, rather than boasting and proclaiming his own deeds, utters a war cry to rally the men to come to Beowulf's aid, to remind them of his great loyalty and protection to them, meaning Beowulf's. Um, it serves as a transitional moment. But look at what's happening here. As Beowulf draws his final breath, his legend carries on. Wiglaf gives it, gives him life by reminding all the men of the great deeds of their fallen leader. This is the transitioning from Beowulf the warrior, the hero, to Beowulf the legend. Together, Wiglaf and Beowulf do defeat the dragon, but Beowulf suffers a mortal wound in the neck because after all, he is only mortal. Beowulf acknowledges that there is no heir to his throne. 
he has no son to bequeath his armor to. He makes a final boast. His land has seen no war during his 50 years of rule. The neighboring territories have feared him. His sword has never been washed in the blood of his own family. So let's pause here um, and look at the cultural context of what's happening. This is a society so rooted in barbarianism that one must boast that you've not shed the blood of your own family. Um, what else is among, sorry, back up. Beowulf makes one final request. He asks Wiglaf to bring him all of the dragon's treasures all that he just traded his life for. The gold, ancient silver, precious jewels, shining armor, gems, to pile up these treasures around him so he can look upon this material victory as he takes his final breaths. What else is amongst these treasures though? Quote, rusty old helmets, beautifully made, but rotting with no hands to rub and polish them. What's this? It stands out, this juxtaposed image. And I want you to think back on this as we read um, the Anglo-Saxon poems next week. We'll see in writing during this time, this emergence of tension between materiality and immateriality. The material, these treasures, Wars have been fought for them. They're lying here in the dragon's cave, tarnishing. Versus the immaterial, Beowulf is dying and what is his reward? These riches that are gonna stay behind and further, tar uh, further tarnish. So at the time it's written, we're gonna see this theme emerge again and again, and it's happening in alignment with the broadening reach of Christianity and the shift of focus from temporal material wealth to a more everlasting immaterial reward that is evoked within monotheistic religions. We have inserted in this part of the text and it's clearly inserted because even parentheses are used to stop the text, quote, so gold can easily triumph, defeat the strongest of men, no matter how deep it is hidden. This is quite obviously an insertion with Christian translation, but not so far removed from what was the trajectory of the original text, I think. Um, it was a time for Beowulf to die. So let's use this character one final time to preach to our audience. Why did he lose this battle? Because he was blinded by his material greed and that focus on earthly riches lost him God's favor in battle. Right after this, things become problematic because in the same dying breaths, first, Beowulf gives thanks to God for all of these jewels, although he says he's bringing them to the people. But then secondly, he also declares, quote, I sold my life for this treasure and I sold it well. Are we meant to give his material lust or greed some lenience because it's for the people? Without that heir, we also see Beowulf pass his reign to Wiglaf, the only warrior that's proven his loyalty, now richly rewarded, because remember again, the multiple cultural purposes of these stories and what this message would have been to a fearful young warrior. So here is this ceremonial passing of the guard, um, giving his golden armor and his rings. We're here again reminded of that cultural role of materialism and um, wealth and status. And then our hero dies. His, um, his soul left his flesh, flew to glory. And once he is clearly safe from battle, Beowulf's men emerge from the woods and they're referred to as shame-faced jackals, how great is that line? Cowards and traitors. Wiglaf breaks them, disowns them, curses them in their future generations. Um, he declares death would be better for them all and for you than the kind of life you can lead branded with disgrace. This is a big deal. This is about the important values of the society, loyalty, honor, friendship, legacy, ancestry, all denied to these men 
that turn their backs on Beowulf. In the same vein that Grendel came from a legacy of evil, these men will now begin a legacy of shame for all their future generations. So, and we close with that. We close with the idea of the role of legacy and immortality, which we talked about in the opening of Beowulf. So um, Wiglaf is asked to build a tower to honor Beowulf so that the ships of sea can see it from afar and know that is Beowulf's tower. The men spend 10 days building it. They seal his ashes and all the dragon's treasure inside. 12 geats ride their horses around the tower, telling of Beowulf's heroic deeds, his greatness, his glory, his legend. Um, and then I've left you with a question of, which honor do you think Beowulf would have preferred? Which is the evidence more of the fame he sought and does he achieve immortality? Well, it's, he is a fictional character. Good afternoon. Please excuse the interruption for a few afternoon announcements. I was seconds, seconds from closing. Um, anyway, closing thought, does he achieve immortality? Um, even though he is a fictional character, it is 2000, late, 2000 years later that we're discussing him. Um, so in our lives, yeah, um, in Beowulf's life, that is for you to determine um, with that final question of which one would have served his purposes more. So, so closes Beowulf and we will um, work with this just a tad bit next week um, in an essay looking at some of the different themes we've worked with.